Testing, testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Yeah, there we go. What you, what you talking about? Yeah, I bet you don't. No, sir. I know that D means drive. <laughs> And R means reverse, and that's about it. Hey, I, I'm, I'm terrible. I, I really don't know that much about them. Okay. Did you turn it on before? Oh, we're live. Okay. We need to get started then, I guess. Doesn't count, brother. If you're not here, it doesn't count. Nah. <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. I'm giving you a hard time. Well, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get underway. I, I want to thank you for taking this time once again out of your Monday evening and coming out and, and being a part of this class as part of the Georgia School of Preaching and Biblical Studies curriculum. As you know, we're going through the books. Let's see, our television's not on. We need to get our monitor on here. We are going through the books of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. I had the remote. Let me see. Give me just a moment. Maybe it's back here on the back. It is a remote. Well, I thought so. Oh, here. I guess, let's see if that's the one. Okay. Oh, no, that was it. It, it's got a little lag. That's right. All right. Well, anyway, we're in Joshua Judges Ruth. I think we now have the monitor on and, and going. And believe it or not, we're actually going to wrap up, Lord willing, we're going to wrap up the book of Judges tonight. And, and that really is hard for me to believe because that means we will have covered Joshua. We will have covered Judges. And the way our syllabus is uh, set out, we will only take two weeks to cover the book of Ruth. And so that means counting tonight, we only have three more class sessions uh, for lecturing. And there will be two class sessions for tests, but of course I won't be here for those. And uh, many of you, most of you probably won't be taking the test. But anyway, it's just hard to believe that we've made this kind of of time. If you would, let's bow together and we'll have a word of prayer and uh, we'll turn our attention to Judges chapter 17. Yes. No, oh, that'd be great. All right, Brother Lewis is going to come and lead us in there.
I believe all systems. All right, well, that sounds good. Here in uh, Judges chapter 17, now you'll notice a recurring theme in the uh, five chapters tonight, and that is all five of these chapters will involve some sort of confusion. We'll talk about religious confusion, we'll talk about national confusion, and we'll talk about moral confusion. And that's because these last five chapters, as we have them in the book of Judges, remember they form an appendix to the book. Much of the book of Judges, it would appear, is not in chronological order. It is not necessarily in sequential time order, which means that sometimes we might be reading events that have happened uh, before previously read about events, if you will. And that's the case here. We're going to see tonight over the course of these five chapters that the evidence suggests that the events recorded in these five chapters would have happened much earlier in the time frame of Judges, probably much more around chapters 3 or 4, if not earlier than that. And so there's pretty good evidence of that, and the reason we're going to see that is we're going to deal with two grandsons tonight. One is going to be the grandson of Moses, and the other is going to be the grandson of Aaron. And so uh, basically cousins, one to, to the other. And if those men were alive during these events as they were, well then that means that these events evidently took place within the first hundred years of Israel settling the land of Canaan. And, and so again, that backs us way up in the book of Judges to at least chapters 3 and 4. And so just keep in mind that uh, these chapters are out of chronological order, but they are reserved until the end by the inspired writer, seemingly, probably, because they just show us how, uh, how bad the situation got during this time period how bad it was in Israel uh, religiously, nationally, morally, how bad it was during the time of the judges. Now, chapter 17, religious confusion, it's only 13 verses, so I'd actually like for us to read the text here. Pick up with me at verse 1. Now, there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah, and he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, he heard her pronounce this curse, here is the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the 1,100, now by the way, that's quite a substantial part amount of money. When he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. Thus, he returned the silver to his mother then his mother took 200 shekels of silver. I don't know why she didn't take the whole amount, but she took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image, and they were in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols or teraphim and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So this man, he basically wanted to have church at home, didn't he, so to speak? Yeah. That, that's what he did. But then verse 6 tells us why. This is characteristic of the time. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what? That's bad. That's yeah. not good, okay? But that, that's what's going on. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, here we are introduced to another character. Verse 7, There was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah 
of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. It sounds like he went on walkabout looking for a, a better place to live or a better situation in which to live. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of this Micah of whom we've been reading as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, Dwell with me, and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you ten shekels of silver per year. See, if that's his annual salary, ten shekels per year, then you know 1,100 shekels that he had stolen from his mother, that was a lot of money. That was a lot of money. I'll give you 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. We would say room and board. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now notice, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. Very, very interesting. All right, this chapter breaks down, as you see on the screen to my left, very easily in two parts. First of all, we'll say a few things about Micah's household shrine and then secondly, about this young Levite that he takes in who became his personal priest. So Micah's household shrine. Now, it just shows you the, the state of affairs in this situation when we realize that Micah had stolen from his own mother. Okay? And he had stolen quite substantially from his own mother. Now, she says that she had wholly dedicated that, that silver to the Lord, and notice in your uh, English version that Lord is in all caps, which means that she's acknowledging Yahweh. She and Micah both will acknowledge Yahweh to an extent, and yet she only winds up using a fraction of it when it comes time for him to make his idol. And so that's interesting. I, I don't know any reason to give you as to why she did that, but that's, that's what we read there in the text. Now, secondly, it's evident that evidently Micah and his mother, they wanted to honor Yahweh. She had dedicated that money to Yahweh, and, and then when she blessed her son, when he returned it, notice at the end of verse 2, that she even blessed him by Yahweh. So it's evident that they want to worship him, but what also becomes clearly evident is that they're not going to do it in accordance with with his will. Now keep in mind, worship is always offered from a person of inferior or subordinate status or role to another who is superior. And so by the very nature of what worship is and what worship entails, the one who is superior always gives the terms and the conditions for worship. And the worshiper, he is to follow those terms. So when we're dealing with God and man, obviously God is superior. We are inferior. Who decides how worship should go? Who decides? Well, God. That's exactly right. It should be according to God's will and not our will. But here with Micah, he, he is definitely going to deviate from the instructions that we find in the Pentateuch. Notice that the last bulleted point here, Micah and his mother, they obviously conceived of God as being representable by certain images. Uh, we read there in verse 4 that the 200 shekels were given to the silversmith. He made a carved image and a molded image. Well, that's a violation of the very second commandment. Look here with me on the screen at what the Ten Commandments said, Exodus 20 and verse 4. 
Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. We know from having the New Testament that later on Jesus said to the Samaritan woman that God is spirit. God is a spirit being and as such he did not want his worshipers incorrectly assuming or incorrectly understanding, we would say misunderstanding, that God had some kind of physical image or some kind of physical form. No, God is spirit. And so he tells his worshipers in the Ten Commandments, don't be making images, don't be making idols. And yet that's exactly what Micah has done here in the text that we've been reading. Now also in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 15, on that occasion Jesus taught this. He said, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And so if we're going to worship God, it had better be God's way because if we deviate and we start implementing the doctrines of men, whether it be our own or some doctrines that others have, have given to us, Jesus says, look, that renders your worship as vain, empty, useless. And so we're already seeing that Micah and his mother and their household, they've got some real problems here in Judges chapter 17. Now, as we go further, we see that his disregard for God's pattern even goes worse or goes further than this. He essentially, in verse 5, he supplanted the tabernacle, which at this time, most of the time in the period of the judges is at Shiloh, but he's made his own shrine. And so when he has his own household shrine, he has supplanted the tabernacle as being God's center of worship. He had no authority to do that. Next, he also rejected the Levitical priesthood that God had set aside in the law of Moses. He set that aside by first consecrating his own son, one of his own sons who would have been a part of the tribe of Ephraim, if we're understanding this correctly. He would not have been a Levite. But, but Micah says, all right, now my son's my priest. I've got my household shrine set up here at the house. I've got my idols, my carved image, my molding image, molten image. I've got the teraphim or the little household idols. I've got all that I need to, to worship Yahweh. <laughs> Who said? Who said? Because what you're doing is going completely against God's inspired pattern. Now, the key statement for the entire book of Judges, believe it or not, the key statement, many would say, it appears right here in chapter 17 and verse 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a pitiable statement, a sad commentary on this era of Israelite history. And what it really bespeaks is a lack of real leadership. You know, the Israel was really wanting and needing godly strong men who would stand up and, and, and guide them in the right direction. And from time to time, God would give them such men. We, we read about various judges, uh, many of whom were, were devout and, and strong spiritually, at least in some ways. And yet, all of those reforms were short-lived, relatively speaking. It was just a matter of time before Israel would apostatize yet again and go back into sin. And so they lacked a continuity of real leadership. And that results in all kinds of corruption and confusion. And as we're seeing here in chapter 17, this included even religious confusion. Micah and his mother obviously are confused about the manner in which to properly worship Yahweh. Obviously they don't know how or if they did they were choosing not to do it properly because they have definitely deviated from God's pattern. 
All right, now the last half of this chapter, verses 7 through 13, let's, let's say something about this young priest that Micah now takes on. He was a Levite, so at least he was from the priestly tribe, but he was apparently discon, uh, discontented with his allotted inheritance. And the reason we draw that conclusion is because you may remember back in the book of Joshua, the tribe of Levi was not given any tribal land allotments. Instead, the tribe was given 48 different cities scattered throughout the entirety of Canaan, if you will. 48 different cities. And uh, Bethlehem of Judah was not one of those cities. And so when we read that this young Levite was coming from Bethlehem of Judah, he, he's already come apparently to Bethlehem of Judah from somewhere else, it would appear, because if his Levitical family had remained in one of the Levitical cities, he would have had to leave there in order to find himself in Bethlehem of Judah. Now he's left Bethlehem of Judah and he's traveled up into the mountains of Ephraim. This man apparently is not contented with whatever inheritance he had been given. And so he's a man on the move, so to speak. He's looking, the Bible says, for a place to stay. I think we probably can understand that. He's looking for a better deal, perhaps. <laughs> he's looking for a better situation. At least that seems very plausible. And so I have all of that here uh, in the, uh, on the screen. Next, Micah is willing. Once Micah meets this young man, he, he, he comes up to his house and they meet and they talk. When Micah realizes that, hey, this is a Levite. You know, I've been using my own son. We're, we're Ephraimites. And Micah knew enough about the law, at least, to know that the priests were really supposed to come from the tribe of Levi. So when he finds out this young man's background, he's willing to make a financial commitment. He says, look, I'm willing to take you on. I'm going to provide your sustenance there, verse 10, which means you can live with me. I'll feed you. I'll, I'll, I'll provide for you. I'm going to give you a suit of clothes. And, and I'm also going to pay you an annual salary of 10 shekels per year. And so Micah reminds me of many people in the modern religious world. And that is that their religion is strong enough that they're willing to make a financial commitment to it. But what is sad about that is that they're being financially committed to practices that are in error, things that are wrong. And, and now we really see a lot of that in our day and time. And so Micah makes us think of so many who fit that general mold even still today. I believe we're correct when we notice here in the last part at the bottom of the screen that when you boil it down, even though Micah has a religious uh, vein running through him, no doubt about that, in the final analysis, Micah and the Levite both seem to be more concerned with pleasing themselves than with pleasing God. And again, as I just stated, that's, that's the case with a lot of religious people today. They, they, they might go to church every Sunday. They, they might sit in a pew and listen to sermons and, and do all of that. But when you really boil it down to the true thoughts and intents of their heart, they're more concerned pleasing themselves and doing things the way they want to do things than they are pleasing God. And so that, that's a real problem, and that's what we can see here uh, most likely with both Micah and Levi. In fact, in verse 13, Micah's own words when he said, Now I know that the Lord, notice he's using Yahweh there, so he's still talking about the true God. I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as priest. That tells you and me that this man is not totally ignorant. He can't plead total ignorance because he, he knows enough to know that Levi was the priestly tribe. He knows enough to know that. Now, he should have known enough to know also, though, that the priests 
were not only Levites, the priests were particularly the descendants of whom? Aaron. He should have known that. What we're going to find out, now this is spoiler alert, but what we're going to find out near the end of next chapter, chapter 18, Lord willing, is that this young Levite is the grandson of Moses. Well, Moses was of the tribe of Levi, but Moses was not Aaron. And that means this young man is a Levite, but he's not qualified to be a priest. But hey, if you've already had your Ephraimite son to be priest, then I guess you view it as a step up if you can have a Levite as priest, even though he's not a rightful descendant of Aaron. Uh, also here from verses 2 and 13, there are hints that this man's religion was more superstition and really manipulation of God than it was a relationship with God. You know, he had heard his mother place a curse on whoever had stolen her 1,100 shekels of silver. And apparently that struck a chord of fear in Micah's heart, and he came clean. He says, Mama, I have it. It's right here. And then she pronounced a blessing at the end of verse 2, and the way they thought the, the blessing supposedly counteracted the curse that she had previously made. And so that you, you can see how that almost lends itself towards superstition. And then in verse 13, even though he's built idols, even though he's got the teraphim, these household idols, he thinks he can manipulate God into giving God his good favor because, Lord, I've got a Levite now serving as priest. Well, so much is wrong with this on so many levels. And it made me think of the proverbial statement, Proverbs 14 and verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of what? Ways of death. And so, friends, let me just warn us all and remind us all that when it comes to our religion, when it comes to how we worship, when it comes to our religious practice, when it comes to the doctrines that we believe and that we teach, we need to be very, very careful to make doubly sure that we are following what the Bible teaches and that we're not just simply going after something that seems right. Well, that seems all right to me. Well, Proverbs 14, 12 tells us that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. The example of Micah and his mother and their household would remind us that this doesn't cut it. We don't want to make the same mistakes that we see here in chapter 17. All right, let me pause here before we, uh, or as we make ready now to go into chapter 18. Do we have any thoughts or any comments or questions? Okay, that's an interesting take. Uh, you know, he, he has the ephod, he has the, the carved image, the molten image, the little idols, uh, the shrine, like Dayton is saying. And so it's as if maybe he can use those as charms, perhaps, or talismans, if you will, in, in trying to curry the favor of God. And yet it doesn't work that way. God wants an honest and sincere heart, number one, and he wants an honest and sincere heart that submits and obeys what he tells us to do. That's what God wants. And in that way, we really demonstrate our love for God, do we not? Absolutely. All right, very good. Any other thoughts?
Now, Emmett brings up a good point. A lot of times when, when we get into religious confusion, it can become generational. It, it can be passed on. And, and how many times have we heard people tell us, well, look, I'm this, I, I'm this religion, whatever, religion X, because my mom and my daddy were religion X. And, and my grandparents were religion X. And so we've all been this all these years, and that's what I'm going to be. Well, back up to verse 3, uh, Emmett is right. The mother should have known better. As a mother, she should have been able to guide her son. But here when she is speaking, his mother said midway through verse 3, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to Yahweh for my son. But notice, she was in error. She says, to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. And so she should have been in a position to teach him better, but she wasn't doing the job. And now what he winds up having done with the silversmith is what she wanted done all along. And that's a good point because what we see is, is religious confusion, it definitely can span generations. It can be passed from, from mama to child to grandchild and, and so forth and so on, or daddy to child and grandchild. It can certainly work that way. All right, any other thoughts as we get ready now to, to move to another type of confusion? Yes, Rich? A great comment. Uh, in some ways, Rich, I, I'm with you. I wonder if doctrinal error in professed, professed Christianity, in some ways, I wonder if it's not more dangerous than just raw unbelief. Because with raw unbelief, at least everybody recognizes you for what you are. They recognize, hey, this is an infidel. This is an unbeliever. Whereas somebody in doctrinal error, denominational error particularly, a lot of people, they, they, don't, they don't know to discern any difference. You know, like you're saying, uh, at least he's religious. You know, he's, he's doing this, he's doing that. Yeah, but what, what's important is, am I pleasing to God? That's what's important. So that too is a great comment. Well, now, let's see, Dayton, in the chapter, the young man is from Levi, but apparently Micah is from Ephraim. Uh, he, he made the young man the priest, and, and, and see, Dayton, we're going to see that this is Moses' grandson. Think about that. Yes. Uh, that's exactly right. That, that's what worries me about this is how can we go just, just two generations? You know, we've gone from Moses to his son and now to Moses' grandson, and he is so far off doctrinally that he will agree to this, that he will be a part of this. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to get into that more here in this chapter. Uh, we, we dealt with religious confusion. Now, that's going to continue. We could continue that into chapter 18, but also here, we're going to pick up what we could call national confusion. Uh, these are dark times. These are confusing.
as we get down to these last five chapters. Uh, you can go back to Joshua 19. And in Joshua chapter 19, you can see a preview, you might say, of these very events. How that Dan is not going to uh, receive their allotment. Why is that? Well, look at Joshua 19 and verse 47. And the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Okay, Do you think that means that God didn't know how much land to give them? That's not what that means. God knew exactly what to give them. If the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them, the, the more plausible explanation is Dan must not have gotten all that they had coming. Okay? Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and possessed it and dwelt therein and they called this Leshem, which is in the far northern extremity of Palestine, they called it Dan. They gave the city a new name after the name of Dan, their father. Now, regarding the chronology or the timing of this, evidently what we're reading about here in chapter 18, it must have happened shortly after the death of Joshua. Uh, apparently Joshua, he divided the appropriate land to Dan as he did all of the tribes. But as we know, Israel did in many cases, the people fell short of seizing it for themselves. You know, e even after the land had been initially allotted and divided up, it was then upon the individual tribes to do the mop-up duty and to go throughout their own region, their own allotment, and to exterminate and drive out any remnants of the inhabitants. Well, obviously, Dan, like many other tribes, they did not do that. Uh, go back with me to chapter 1 of Judges here, and we can see back earlier in the book, which is much more closely akin uh, to the actual time frame here of chapter 18, that the Amorites, Judges 134, the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. And so just like I intimated a moment ago, God had divided Dan's inheritance to Dan through Joshua. It's not that Dan didn't get enough land. It's not that Dan was overlooked or neglected. No, 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 no. Dan evidently did not have the faith, did not have the resolve, and did not have the determination to do what God said for them to do in driving out the Amorites. And so if, if God gives you, for example, if God gives you this much land, and, and then that's how much land you would have needed. If that's what God gave you, then that would have been sufficient. But if due to a lack of faith and obedience, you let your Amorite enemies constrict you down to this much land, well, then you got a problem. And I believe that's probably uh, very likely where we see Dan in this circumstance, or the circumstance, rather, in which we find them in this reading. Now, once they come up, uh, they're traveling northward to, to try to find a new place to go. And what we're going to realize is they wanted an enemy they thought would be easier to defeat than the Amorites. That, that's what it's going to boil down to. And the Philistines. The Philistines were also encroaching on the tribe of Dan as well. And so as they're traveling north, they stop in at Micah's house. And you can read about that in verse 2. They went to the mountains of Ephraim at the end of verse 2 to the house of Micah and they lodged there. Verse 3, while they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. Now we don't know how or why, but apparently they've had a, a, some history maybe with this young man. You know, we've already suggested that he was a traveling man. <laughs> we've already suggested that Wherever he came from, that Bethlehem of Judah probably was not his original home because it's not a Levitical city. And so they recognized the voice of this young Levite. They turned aside and said to him, Who brought you here? 
What are you doing in this place? And what do you have here? In other words, we weren't expecting to find you in Ephraim. You know, the last time we heard from you, you were in Judah maybe, or you were over here, you were over there. Who brought you here? And so they seem very intrigued that this uh, young Levite is in the mountains of Ephraim. And yet, as you can see at the bottom of our screen, without any pause whatsoever, uh, once he tells them that I've been hired by Micah, verse 4, I, I have become his priest, verse 4, well, then they don't have any pause in just asking uh, if he would inquire of the Lord for them. Hey, isn't that something? Here's a man that has usurped a position that is not legitimately his, and yet the Danites just act like that's not a problem. Hey, he claims to be a priest. Maybe he can inquire of the Lord for it. Well, that, that doesn't make good sense. And so you can read about that in verses 5 and 6. Now, these were basically five spies who had been sent out from the Danites traveling northward. They're the ones who uh, run into the young Levite here at Micah's house. Well, they go on. After they uh, ask him to do that, he tells them in verse 6, Go in peace. The presence of the Lord be with you on your way. So those five men, the Danite spies, they departed and they went northward to Laish. And there they found a, a city, we might even say perhaps a colony of people. They saw the people who were there, verse 7, how they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians and they had no ties with anyone. And you know what those five Danite spies thought when they found this situation? Sitting ducks. Brother God bless. Sorry to hear. Uh, they thought sitting ducks. You know, we, we can take this village. It, this kind of riles me up personally because God had given them the land that God wanted them to have. Right? He gave them the land that God wanted Dan to settle, but they didn't have the faith and the resolve and the obedience to go against those enemies, the Amorites and the Philistines. And so they travel, it's, it's about 100 miles, 100 miles northward up to Laish or Leshem, and they find this sitting duck. They find this little city or this village that they say, hey, we can take them. And so they basically just substitute what they would rather do in the place of what God wanted them. And that's the bottom of the screen there. They deemed the land very good and they deemed the inhabitants sufficiently weak. And so that means, hey, we'd rather have this. We don't want what God tells us we can have. That's too hard. So we're going to take the easy way out and we'll go up north and defeat this small city. So much is wrong with that. Well, now, these five spies, they come back. They tell the, the people back home that, hey, the city is good, that uh, we don't need to hesitate, verse 9. There's no lack of anything in the land, verse 10. We need to go do something about it. We need to go and conquer this city and take it for ourselves. And so verse 11 now beginning and going through verse 21 they, leave, uh, they lead 600 Danite warriors northward to take their new land. And as they're traveling northward once again, guess where they turn in at? Micah's house. And so pick up reading with me at verse 14. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, the 600 warriors, do you know that there are in these houses an ephod, household idols or teraphim, a carved image and a molded image? Now, therefore, consider what you should do. In other words, it's as if to say, hey, just so you know, there's a whole lot of religious uh, inventory right here. What do you think we ought to do about that? Of course, they're going to wind up plundering it and taking it for their own. 
Verse 15, so they turned aside there and they came to the house of the young Levite man, to the house of Micah, and greeted him. The 600 men armed with their weapons of war who were of the children of Dan stood by the entrance of the gate. And then to make, as it were, a long story short, with a, with a uh, entourage of 600 fighting men, would you say you have the muscle? You've got the muscle behind you. Well, they go in and they steal the contents of Micah's shrine and then they even go so far as to convince the, uh, the young man, hey, you'd be better off serving us than you would serving this one man and his family. So, so move down with me to verse 17. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the land went up. Entering there, they took the carved image. They took the ephod. They took the household idols. They took the molded image. The priest, the young man, stood at the entrance of the gate with the 600 men who were armed with the weapons of war. When these went into Micah's house and, and took all of those items, the young Levite said to them at the end of verse 18, What are you doing? And they said to him, Be quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better? For you to be a priest to the household of one man? Or that you be a priest to a tribe and a family in Israel? You can serve 600 families. You, you could serve our tribe up in the north. Wouldn't that be better? And notice verse 20. So the priest's heart was glad. Okay. <laughs> He's not upset anymore. He's not mad anymore. He had asked them, what are you doing? But when they said, look, just put your hand over your mouth, come with us, and you, you can preach for the big church. You ever heard that? Yeah. All right, see, now you see what's kind of happening. Why do you want to preach for the little church when you can come with us and you can preach for the big church? And he says, all right. The priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod, the household idols, the carved image, and he took his place among the people. And they turned and departed and put the little ones, the livestock, and the goods in front of them. And so this is just thievery. Now, granted, the things that they're stealing, Micah had no right to possess anyway. He didn't need any idols. This was wrong. But they, but they were his. And so this is thievery, plunder, stealing, whatever you want to call it. Um, by their recruiting Micah's so-called priest, this young Levite, it just shows us that the religious confusion that we were uh, dwelling on in the previous chapter, that it's continuing here in chapter 18, and not only is it continuing, it's now going to infect and affect hundreds of families. Hundreds of families. Uh, the Danites are going to prove to be just as willful as Micah and his mother and their household when it comes to worshiping God in a perverted manner. The Danites are going to do that just like Micah had been doing. And so they recruit Micah's priest, as we've already read about. And this just shows us, sadly, that this young Levite, he proves to be no more than a hireling. What do we mean by hireling? What does that mean? Okay, I'm sorry. Goes where the money goes. Yeah. In, in other words, a hireling, he's not so much concerned about principle. He's not concerned about what's right versus what's wrong. You know, what he was doing with Michael was wrong. Uh, but now he can do what's wrong with the Danites and probably make more money. <laughs> and and probably, probably be in a better circumstance, he thinks. And so his heart was made glad as I, I said, of course, tongue in cheek at the opportunity to minister to a larger, quote, congregation. I know that's not exactly the case, but there are some parallels. And what's so sad about this is he proves himself to be disloyal to Micah, of whom we read back in uh, chapter 17, that Micah took him in and basically the young man became like a son. He became like a son to Micah. 
But but now that the Danites have come calling and hey, we we're more people, you can have a better opportunity. Well, then he's ready to go with them, and and then that's the verse, Judges seventeen and verse eleven. The Levite was previously he was content to dwell with Micah, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. Yet now he's willing to throw all that out the window. Let's move on to greener pastures. Right? Now, how, how do you think Micah's going to react to this when he realizes what has happened? He's going to be upset. You know, they stole my idols. They stole my priest. You know, who, who do they think they are? And so, let me see. I think I hit the wrong direction. There. Not only is Micah obviously disturbed by this. But in verse 22, we can read that even Micah's neighbors rally around him. Verse 22, when they, the Danites, were a good way from the house of Micah, continuing on their trek northward, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house, his neighbors, they gathered together and they overtook the children of Dan. And they called out to the children of Dan as they were overtaking them from behind so the children of Dan turned around, verse 23, and said to Micah, What ails you that you have gathered such a company? In other words, what's the problem? Why, why is there so many of you gathered up and, and have come up here to catch up with us? What's going on? So Micah said, You have taken away my gods which I made. Now, by the way, any god that you make, that's a problem. That's a problem. And, and so Micah's got his own problems. There's no doubt about that. But he says, you have taken away my gods, which I made, and the priest, who was like a son to me, and you have gone away. Now what more do I have? How can you say to me what ails you? In other words, we would say, what do you mean what's my problem? You know what my problem is. I've got a real problem because you've come and plundered my shrine. Well, the children of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us. What, what, translate that into modern English colloquial speech. What would someone say? Keep your, your mouth shut. That's what Dan said. They said, If you don't want there to be a problem, there will be a real problem. You better keep your mouth shut. They intimidated Micah and his neighbors. So they said, do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry men fall upon you and you lose your life with the lives of your household. They say, basically, yeah, you might have lost your idols and you might have lost your priest, but if you keep talking, you're going to lose your life. Well, notice verse 26. Then the children of Dan went their way and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him... I don't know how many neighbors he had gathered together, but I suspect it was far less than 600. And so when he saw that the children of Dan were too strong for him, he turned, pouting, probably sulking, mad and upset, but he went back to his house because he knew there wasn't anything he could do about it. And so this is that old uh, philosophy of life, might makes... That philosophy says that what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine if I'm strong enough to take it. And you know, a lot of people live their life that way, don't they? They do. They believe that might makes right. And it shows no respect, no respect for their fellow countrymen, Micah, no respect for his rights, no respect for his property, and it just shows you the national and the moral confusion going on. It's national confusion because Dan is not willing to settle where God wanted them to settle. So now they're, they're trampsing, as it were, all through the country, going through everybody else's land to go north to find a place of their own. Okay? Uh, it's also national confusion because of the way they're treating their countrymen here. Micah, they have no respect. And yet there's certainly moral confusion. And in the chapters that are coming up, we're going to see that. Now, the last five verses of chapter 18 
Uh, they tell us in verse 27 that the children of Dan, they are successful against this northern city of Laish or Leshem. So they, they do conquer that city. Uh, they, they were far from Sidon, and so that meant that uh, they couldn't get any reinforcements. Notice I, I've supplied for you here at the bottom. Uh, some have theorized that this little village of Laish that these were possibly colonists from Sidon, and yet they were too isolated. They were too far removed to get any kind of military help in time, if that were the case. And so they have taken the easy way out, a lack of faith, a lack of determination concerning the Amorites meant that they were unable to take the land that God had allotted them. Instead, they travel a hundred miles north. They pick on this little village that's secure and isolated from all others, and they, uh, they destroy them, and they decide to take that land. And so that, that's how Dan, or at least a, a very large portion of Dan, gets settled initially in the north. But it's also how, verses 30 and 31, it's also how the perverted worship that had started in Micah's house, how it has now become the perverted worship of the Danites. Read verses 30 and 31. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image and Jonathan the son of Gershom. Now, the King James and the uh, the King James and the New King James says Gershom the son of Manasseh. But there's other manuscript evidence and it's brought out in the American Standard Version and the English Standard Version. This Gershom is actually the son of whom? Moses, Moses, okay? So if, if Jonathan, that's this young Levite, so we've been dealing with him since chapter 17. Now we learn his name. His name's Jonathan. He's a young Levite. His daddy was named Gershom. His granddaddy was Moses. Yet this boy, this young man, is willing to, to, to do all of this idolatry and participate in all of this perverted worship He's not the descendant of Aaron, which means he's not even qualified to be a priest. And yet, that's exactly what he's acting like. Over here in 1 Chronicles 23, here you have that lineage. Now concerning Moses, the man of God, his sons were named of the tribe of Levi. The sons of Moses were, who's the first one named? Gershom. All right, that's Jonathan's daddy. Gershom, and then Eliezer, so forth and so on. And so that tells us how the perverted worship of the Danites really came to be. You know, it would last perhaps as long as 300 years, all the way until the desolation of Shiloh, probably at the hands of the Philistines. This uh, destruction of Shiloh would be the captivity of the land that's mentioned here. So again, read these last two verses. The children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, it should be, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. Not Babylonian, not Assyrian captivity in all likelihood, but probably that brought on by the Philistines. So they set up for themselves Micah's carved image which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. And so maybe for as many as 300 years, now you've got a, another, an alternate worship center competing with the tabernacle. God's worship center is the tabernacle. God's worship center most of this time is at Shiloh. But now you've got an alternative Worship center in the far north of the land, it's perverted worship. You've got idolatry going on. You've got an unqualified priest up there and his descendants practicing. Uh, it just shows you how when a problem is not stopped, when a problem is not squelched, it can grow and it can get worse, bigger. Here in Psalm 78, we've actually got a reference about 
the tabernacle being at Shiloh until it was uh, till the destruction there. When God heard this, he was wroth, and he greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among them, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy. And so that's probably all that while up until this event, then uh, that's probably how long that Jonathan and that shrine or, or the worship center in Dan, how long that it had been competing against the tabernacle. That, that's never good. It should always be God's way, not man's. All right, any thoughts or any questions as we, uh, we're about to take a, a little break, but as we prepare to go into chapter 19, any thoughts or any questions? It's always simpler if, see, the nature of faith is, faith is what's in not seen. Faith is the conviction of things not seen. Like Dayton is saying, God is not seen. God is the invisible God, 1 Timothy 6, uh, 15 and 16, uh, Colossians chapter 1, 14. God is the invisible God, and so it is faith. It is faith by which we serve Him. We walk by faith, not by what? By sight. Very good. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. So let's pause at this juncture. We're going to take us a little break. We have refreshments over here. And uh, then we'll have three more chapters, Lord willing, when we resume. And the, the class will be over and the book of Judges will be concluded for this study.
Well, now I don't say pecan. I don't. But where I grew up, I grew up and there was always called this. No people, I'll call this a turn I grew up in Alabama. Uh, outside of Anniston. I have heard of that. That's not far out of the book. Somebody's pulling. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> I say you drop some wisdom on the I guarantee you, if that boy will heal, he'll heal. He'll, 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 All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get underway. Let's go. Yeah. Right. Welcome back. We now turn our attention to Judges chapter 19. We've seen religious confusion, we've seen national confusion, and now for the next three chapters, sadly, we're going to notice moral confusion. Uh, as you can see here on the screen, the first section is the Levite and his concubine. In the previous episode involving Micah, we had a Levite who had come from Bethlehem. Here we have a Levite who takes a concubine. A concubine is a secondary wife. She has all of the rights and privileges of a normal wife, except her children will not be heirs in the same way of the father. And so uh, you know and I know this was not God's plan. This was a departure from God's plan for marriage, which was one man, one woman, for life. And, and so as this episode opens up in what we know is uh, Judges 19, 
we're going to begin with a dysfunctional marriage, a dysfunctional relationship. Again, in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. And so again, this is going to exemplify for us, this is characteristic of the confusion of this time. Uh, this man has taken a concubine. They've obviously had some kind of marital problems because as you can read here in these nine verses, she leaves her husband, she plays the harlot, and she winds up back in her father's house. Well, after so long, I believe it was after four months, verse 2, the husband decides that he's going to go and try to reconcile with this concubine wife and try to bring her back home. Well, he goes and he does that, and he's warmly received, verses 3 and 4, for sure warmly received by the father-in-law when he shows up to take his concubine back. Uh, so much that the father-in-law detains him for three days and says, look, stay with us. We'll eat and drink and we'll visit, as we would say. And so he's warmly received, apparently by both the woman and her father, it would seem. And he winds up staying into the fifth day. The uh, father-in-law doesn't want the man to leave. And so he stays a fourth day. He uh, stays a fifth day. And finally, on day five, he has to say, Look, we've got, to, uh, we've got to go. And so verse 9, if you want to move down there with me. And when the man stood to depart, that is on the fifth day, he and his concubine and his servant, there were three of them in this traveling party, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. Please spend the night again. The idea See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so that you may get home. But verse 10, however, the man was not willing to spend that night going into day six. So he rose and departed and came to opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. With him were the two saddled donkeys, his concubine also with him. And so it's obvious that the father did not want his daughter to leave. You can see that as I have it on the screen. And yet finally on day five, it would appear the reconciliation has been accomplished. It's time to go back home. So he and his concubine and their servant, they start late in the day on day five. They make it to Jebus, which is the old name for Jerusalem, that would have been only about five miles. They, they make the first five miles and they're coming up to Jerusalem, but he did not want to stay there, verses 11 and 12. And that's because at this point in time, remember we read earlier on in the book of Judges that the Benjamites did not take Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Uh, at this point in time, Jebus or Jerusalem was still in heathen hands. And so he basically tells his servant, he says, look, I don't want to stay here with the heathen. Let's go on to Gibeah. Well, that's another five miles. So that means if we travel a total of 10 miles here this first afternoon, we can make it to Gibeah. Those are Benjamites. Those are fellow Israelites. And I would rather stay with them than I would stay with the heathen, the Jebusites, there in Jerusalem. Now, notice what I have, and if you've read ahead, and I hope you read ahead each week, if you've read ahead, you know the, the horrible, the horrific treatment that the woman is going to receive in Gibeah. And what's ironic about that is that the Levite refused to stay in Jerusalem. He refused to stay with the Jebusites, only then to be treated the way that he was, and especially the way that she was, by their fellow countrymen in Gibeah. So that, that's not only tragic, but it's very ironic. Now, what happens here is I, I want you to see it's so bad that later on in Israelite history, the Holy Spirit is still inspiring prophets to write about this. This is how bad an account this is uh, Hosea said in Hosea 9.9, 9, 
They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. So he's referring back hundreds of years earlier to this time, Judges 19, and he's saying the people of my day have corrupted themselves as deeply as those wicked Gibeites had done back in this day. Therefore, God, he will remember their iniquity, he will visit their sins, and then in the next chapter, Hosea brings it up again, Hosea 10 and verse 9, I'm reading from the English Standard Version here, from the days of Gibeah, you have sinned, O Israel, there they have continued, shall not the war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? And so the long and short of this is, is that the depravity and the wickedness of the citizens of Gibeah here in Judges chapter 19, it was so bad that it basically became a byword or it became a proverb. In other words, they were infamous going forward in Israelite history. The men of Gibeah were infamous for this atrocity. And so that's just noteworthy. We need to be mindful of that. Now, as you read there in verses 15 through 19 of this chapter, when uh, finally they, they travel the 10 miles total, it's uh, already getting the end of day, it's becoming dark, the close of day, and as they come into the city of Gibeah, none of the native residents offer this man, his concubine and his servant, None of them offer them. Instead, it comes down to a fellow Ephraimite who's for some reason he's living there in the tribe of Benjamin. He's living in the city of Gibeah and he takes them in. And so look at verse 16. Just then an old man came in from his work in the field at evening who also was from the mountains of Ephraim, he was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. And then verse 20, This old man said, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. This old man seemed to know that that, that would have been a bad idea. You don't need to stay out here in the open street or the open square all night long. You can stay with me. So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet, and they ate and drank. Probably already there should be two red flags for this, uh, this traveling Levite. Number one, he comes to a city of his own countrymen, the city of Gibeah, and none of the native residents offer hospitality. That's red flag number one. Number two, as they're waiting around in the city square, this old man comes in from his work in the fields, and he says, look, you, you don't need to stay out here all night. You don't need to stay out here in the street all night. That, that seems to indicate something would happen. So that's red flag number two. And, and so the man is taken in uh, by this uh, old man from Ephraim. Now, notice the moral perversion and the tragedy that, that happens here. Pick up with me at verse 22. The, the man, his concubine, his servant, they're being lodged with this older man from Ephraim there in the city of Gibeah. Everything seems to be fine until verse 22. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly... Certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we may know him carnally. I'm reading from the New King James Version. So, do they ask for the woman? No, they're not asking for the woman. It reminds you of Genesis 19, doesn't it? Which we have right here. You know, it reminds you of Sodom and Gomorrah. Those wicked men in Sodom, they too uh, asked for the men. They, they weren't asking for the women. And so it just tells you about the, the wickedness and the depravity. Verse 23, 
But the man, the Ephraimite, the master of the house, he went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, no, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. And now, he's going to do something similar to what Lot did. You know, and it makes no sense to us. Lot offered his own daughters. Well, notice this man says, verse 24, Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine, the wife that he had brought with him into town, let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. All right. Is there any kind of defense for the way that he offered up those women? There's no defense. Okay? No defense. Uh, this is indicative of a time when you had better believe there's moral confusion. You'd better believe it. It's also indicative of a time, sadly, when the life of a woman was undervalued in comparison to the life of a man. It'd make it right, but, but that, that's the way they were messed up in their thinking. And so here he is so concerned about providing for the protection of the man, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, but apparently the, the woman and even his own virgin daughter, he's willing to offer them up. So to us, we just can't make any sense of that, and there's no defense for it. Now, we have to begin asking ourselves the question, why in the world would Benjamin? Why in the world? These are supposed to be God's people, true or false? That's true. They're supposed to be God's people. Where do they learn to act like this? Why, why do you have some who are supposedly God's people or supposed to be? Why are they asking for this man so that they can rape him? And that's, that's what they're wanting to do. Well, look at this verse now. Remember this all the way back from chapter 1. Judges 1, 21. And the children of Benjamin, there including the ones in Gibeah, did not drive out the Jebusites, that inhabited Jerusalem just five miles away. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem unto this day. I, I'm getting ahead of myself as far as the slide order, but I'm going to submit to you that God's people learned this kind of heinous practice from the presence of the heathen in the land. Maybe not particularly the Jebus Jebusites. Maybe it was another pocket over here or over there, another group. But I'm going to submit to you that the most plausible explanation as to how can God's people learn to act so wickedly and so depraved, I'm going to say from the people that were left in the land that God said the whole time, you're supposed to drive them out. They're not supposed to be here. And so as I've already pointed out next, sadly, it's not right, but it's just the way it was. Women were not viewed on the same plane as men in this ancient time. And so pick up with me, verse 25. The men, the wicked men of Gibeah, would not heed the old Ephraimite man. So the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. Uh, you know, the, the men weren't, weren't interested. They weren't having it. And so basically it's just like the concubine was, was thrown out there anyway to appease them. And they knew her, that is, they knew her sexually. They raped her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was. Notice the Bible here doesn't call him her husband. Has he acted like a husband? No, he hasn't acted. He's acted like a master. And so here the Bible doesn't call him her husband anymore. The Bible calls him her master. She falls down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. In other words, it was breaking day. Verse 27, it says it again. When her master arose in the morning, 
and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. Now Paul's right there. Apparently, he had just chalked her up as a what? As a loss. I don't think he ever thought he'd see her again. That's what it seems to me. Uh, she was thrown out to this gang of wicked men. And in the morning, he's just getting up to go his way. There's no indication he's going to look for her. There's no indication that he expects to take her home now. So he opens a door, but when he opens a door to go his way, there was his concubine falling at the threshold, at the door of their house, with her hands on the threshold. Now I want you to listen to what this man says. Makes me mad. He said to her, get up and let's be going. So calloused, so cold and indifferent. Get up and let's be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey and the man got up and went to her place. So as we know, basically, uh, she fell down there and, and the idea is she died. And so, as you can see, she was gang raped, she was abused all night long, and ultimately she was going to die as a result of this. He finally makes it back to his home, verse 29, when he entered his house, he took a knife and he laid hold of his concubine, and he divided her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her pieces of her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. We've never seen such a sight. Consider it, confer, and speak up. Well, obviously the strained and callous nature of that relationship. When this chapter began, I told you this was a dysfunctional family. Uh, number one, she's a concubine. He didn't have any business taking a concubine. Number two, she's played the harlot and gone back to her father's house. Number three, he goes to get her. They finally reconcile. But then number four, on their way back home, he allows her to be treated like this. And so it's obvious the, the strained and the callous nature of this relationship uh, between the man and his concubine. But then number two under that, and look, this is a lesson for all time. And this is a lesson that the United States of America needs today. Unchecked, unbridled sexual perversion, it becomes violent and it devalues human life. It doesn't matter if it's male or female. It doesn't matter if it's boys or girls. It devalues human life. People no longer are people. People become things. People become objects. And it just shows you where that sin will lead if it's not stopped, if it's not checked, and if it's not corrected. And so terrible here uh, what befell this, this pitiable woman. Now, the Levite, the reason we read about his chopping her up and sending a body part to each of the 12 tribes, he's circulating the news of his wife's death in the most outrageous manner possible. And when he does this, he truly evokes a national response. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Now, get this, he doesn't have any authority to act this way. He shouldn't act like he's mad. He shouldn't act like he's upset. He's the one that let it happen. Okay? He didn't care about this woman. If he would cared about this woman, he would have acted very, very differently. But now that, that she's dead and he knows she's dead, he wants to act like he's the victim. Hey, that makes me mad too. That can make you mad real fast in a hurry. Uh, it seems that the leadership crisis in Israel here at the close of the book of Judges, it's highlighted using the example of two Levites. Think about that. God had given the, the nation the Levites so that the Levites could function as spiritual leaders. True or false? That's true. Well, go back to the previous two chapters. 
Judges 17, Judges 18, we dealt with a young Levite named Jonathan. Did he really function as a spiritual leader? No. Okay. That shows you what kind of le leadership crisis they had going on. Now, in this chapter, chapter 19, we meet another Levite. Is he acting like a spiritual leader? No, he's not even acting like a fit man. No. And so, these were dark, dark times in Israel's history. All right, any thoughts, any questions on chapter 19 as, uh, before we continue this same saga into chapter 20? Any thoughts? All right, let's go into the next chapter. We're still talking about moral confusion. We, we've got men in Gibeah who want to be with other men. We, we've got those same men who gang rape and kill a woman mercilessly. We've got a husband who acts like he doesn't care until after the fact. And then he acts like he wants to be the victim. And, and that really brings us here to the first 11 verses of chapter 20. When he chops up her body and sends it piece by piece throughout Israel, uh, it, it gets a response. Israel's anger is aroused there. Look at verse 1 of chapter 20. So all the children of Israel came out from Dan in the way north to Beersheba, as well as from the land of Gilead, which is on the other side of the Jordan. And the congregation gathered together as one man before the Lord at Mizpah. And the leaders of all the people of the tribes of Israel presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God. Notice how many now. 400,000 foot soldiers who drew the sword. Okay, he, got, he got his response. He got his response. End of verse 3. Then the children of Israel said, Tell us, how did this wicked deed happen? How in the world did this woman get mutilated like this? What's going on? Now, I want you to get your pens ready because in the next three verses, I want you to circle some words in verses 4, 5, and 6. Verse 4. So the Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, Answered and said, start circling, my, circle it, my concubine and I, circle it, went into Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin, to spend the night. Verse 5, and the men of Gibeah rose against me, circle it, and they surrounded the house at night because of me. And it Paul's right there. So far, has what he said been true? Well, I think now, so far it's been true, yeah. right? Because him and his concubine did go to Gibeah. They did spend the night. And, and who did the men want first? Yeah. They did want him. But, but notice he's talking all about himself. Okay? Pick up midway through verse 5. They intended to kill me. Circle it now. We don't know if that's necessarily true or not. They intended to gang rape him and abuse him, but whether or not they intended to kill him, perhaps. But instead, they ravished my, circle my, concubine, so that she died. Verse 6, so I, circle I, took hold of my, circle my, concubine. I cut her in pieces. I sent her throughout all the territory of the inheritance of Israel because they committed lewdness and outrage in Israel. You know, if you read those verses and you notice the pronouns that he uses, if you didn't know better, you would think that he was the victim. Okay? That just makes me sad. He had given his, his concubine to the dogs, and now he's the one that's upset. Well, you know, they, that, that's true. He, he, there's no doubt that he, it seems that he slanted this story to, to favor his cause and to favor what he wanted to accomplish. I, I don't think there's any question about that. And so let's, let's move on in our slides. Uh, we see that the grisly declaration resulted in a national solidarity. Everybody came together, 400,000 soldiers strong. It was called a crime of lewdness and outrage. 
there in verse 6. It was every bit of that. And then the leaders of Israel made a quick and a unanimous decision. Uh, verse 8, they said, look, none of us will go to his tent, nor will any turn back to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot. We will take ten men out of every hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, a hundred out of every thousand, and a thousand out of every ten thousand to make provisions for the people. In other words, 10% of our forces are going to form a supply line so that when they come to Gibeah in Benjamin, they may repay all the vileness that they have done in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, united together as one man. Now, if you were Gibeah, would you have a problem on your hand? You, you got a problem. You got 400,000 men they're willing to take 40,000 of them just to keep the supplies coming. Okay, so you, you got a problem if you're the men of Gibeah, or at least you should have a problem. But now look at this second section, or the next section, verses 12 through 17. The tribe of Benjamin, Gibeah is just a city in Benjamin. You've got an entire tribe around Gibeah. And the rest of the tribe, they choose tribalism, they choose to stick up for their brothers instead of choosing justice. And so that, that's problem. Look at verse 12. The tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin saying, they went throughout the tribe and they're saying, what is this wickedness that has occurred among you? Verse 13, I have it underlined. Now, therefore, deliver up the men. Deliver us the perverted men who are in Gibeah that we may put them to death and remove the evil from Israel. Now, that's justice. That, that's true justice. Now, they, they weren't wanting to kill the whole tribe initially. That They're going through the whole tribe and they're saying, look, we know, the, we know there were only certain men involved in this. Turn them over. We need, to, we need to deal with them, and that way we can put away this sin. We can put away this evil. Benjamin should have said, you know what? That's right. We need to turn those guys over. They didn't. Verse 13 concludes, But the children of Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brethren, the children of Israel. And so now this has gone from a gang rape. It's gone from murder it's gone from a judicial situation that needs to be executed properly and handled. It's gone from all of that to civil war. One tribe, Benjamin, the whole tribe, against everybody else. Okay? Does that sound like people don't know what's going on? That's moral confusion, man. What you should have done is turned over the perpetrators, let them get their just punishment, and then everybody could have had peace. But no, we're too wicked for that. We're not going to do that. And so they strongly refused choosing civil war instead. Now this is interesting. And by the way, this gave me such a hard time that I, I had to really study on this back even three years ago when I taught this course the first time. The first two times Israel goes up against them, they, they lose. The 400,000, the, the big group. They lose. Well, let's read why. Let's read how this unfolded. Look at verse 18. Then the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God to inquire of God. They said, which of us shall go up first to battle against the children of Benjamin? The Lord said, Judah first. So the children of Israel rose in the morning and encamped against Gibeah and the men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin and the men of Israel put themselves in battle array to fight against them at Gibeah. Then the children of Benjamin came out of Gibeah and on that day they cut down to the ground 22,000 men of the Israelites. And the people, that is the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and again formed the battle line at the place where they had put themselves in array on the first day. Then the children of Israel went up and wept before the Lord until evening and asked counsel of the Lord, saying, Shall I again draw away and cut down to the ground this time 18,000 more of the children of Israel? 
all these drew the sword. Okay, we got a problem. We got a problem. The tribes of Israel, they did inquire of God concerning who should go out first. Normally, if you inquire of God and God tells you what to do, what do you have? Success. Normally. They didn't. They got beat the first time, came back to God, got beat the second time. Okay? And what that tells you is obviously something is either wrong with their motives or something's wrong with their act. Nothing's wrong with God, but something is wrong somewhere with what's going on. And so again, after two defeats, finally in verse 26, then all the children of Israel, that is all the people, went up and came to the house of God and they wept. They sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Verse 27, so the children of Israel inquired of the Lord the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron. I told you earlier we're dealing with two grandsons tonight. We've already dealt with the grandson of Moses. Now we're dealing with the grandson of Aaron. He stood before it in those days saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up. And notice the Lord said something here they didn't say the first two times. Go up for tomorrow what? He didn't say that the first two times. But he says, I will deliver them into your hand. Now, why did Israel fail in their first two attempts? I've got four thoughts that I can't get on the screen, but I've got them right here on my screen, so I won't give them to you if you want to write them down. There's four thoughts as to why perhaps Israel failed the first two times. All right, number one, they were late in consulting God's will. They did consult His will, but doesn't it sound like they had already made up their mind? They had already made up their mind that they were going to go to war. They didn't ask God about that. They came late asking God, God, who goes first? God says, well, if you're going to do this, Judah goes first. So number one, they, they were late in consulting God's will. They had decided much on their own before consulting God. If that's the case, then that's a problem. Number two, perhaps they were self-sufficient in the righteousness of their cause and in the overwhelming advantage of their numbers. Meaning, meaning by that, that they thought they had this one to begin with, okay? It wasn't going to be their overwhelming numbers that caused them to win this battle. It was going to be only if it was God's will and if they followed God's direction, okay? So that's the second thing to think about. Number three, we've got to realize at this time that Israel as a whole, the whole nation, was not lily white and, and sinlessly perfect. Okay? Now they're all outraged and they're mad about, you know, those men of Gibeah, they shouldn't have done that woman that way, blah, 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 blah. But this whole nation's full of idolatry. This whole nation's got their hands dirty, okay? And so it could be that, that God was using these first two battles as an opportunity to punish them too. That's a possibility. To humble them. And then number four, the final consideration is, was their motive wrong? You know, they, everybody got worked up at that tribunal that they had at Mizpah when they let the Levite stand up and he, he gave his speech there in, in verses four, five, and six. Everybody got worked up. And so was their motive really coming out of that tribunal was their motive really righteous indignation where they want to come and put away sin in the land or is it more rash and arrogant vengeance? Could be that. So that's a problem. So th there's at least four possibilities 
as to why God would allow them to lose twice before finally giving them the victory. At least four possibilities, and there's probably more than that. But I can tell you this, the problem is never with whom? Problem never with God. Problem's never with God. It's always with And so finally now, on try three, the last part of this chapter here, finally Benjamin is defeated. I pointed out to you that it's not until this third time that God assures them you'll be victorious. He didn't say that first time. He didn't say it the second time. He did say it this third time, though. He assures them of victory. And then you can read those verses, um, uh, 29 and following, Uh, Basically, Israel, this third time, they use an ambush tactic similar to the one that we read about back in Joshua chapter 8 when they set an ambush for the city of Ai. Remember, they had gotten beaten at Ai first too, hadn't they? They'd lost at Ai once, and then when they went back, they used this ambush tactic, and it worked. And so that's what happens here. And uh, the end of the chapter, look at verse 46. So all who fell of Benjamin that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock at Rimmon. And they stayed at the rock of Rimmon for four months. And the men of Israel turned back against the children of Benjamin and struck them down with the edge of the sword from every city, men and beast, all who were found, they also set fire to all the cities they came to. See, that right there tells you something's wrong. This started out as a problem with one city, with the group of wicked men in one city. And now it's blown up into all this. And so it shows you that Israel as a whole still has a lot of problems. It's not just the tribe of Benjamin. And so let's, let's bring this to a close now, the final chapter of the book. The final chapter of the night, uh, Judges 21, Moral Confusion, Part 3. First of all, there's a dilemma concerning an oath. See, back in chapter 20, when they had that heated assembly, everybody got worked up at Mizpah when the Levite told his story and told what had happened. They had taken a rash oath. And the oath that they had taken is, verse 1, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin as a what? Well, apparently they've killed the women of Benjamin. They've killed all the men except 600. And so now they've got a problem. They finally realize what they've done. They've realized we're we're on the verge. We're about to lose a whole tribe of Israel. We're not going to be known as the 12 tribes anymore. We're about to be known as the 11 tribes because we've about fixed it to where Benjamin's going to become extinct. Well, that's because you overreacted. You did more than what you should have done. You took a rash oath and just a lot of problems, a lot of sin. But anyway, that that brings us down through verse 7. But somebody comes up with a way. Look at verse 8. So they're talking about this problem. And they said, what one is there from the tribes of Israel who did not come up to Mizpah before the Lord? And in fact, when they got to going back through the records of the meeting, I suppose, they found that no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were counted, indeed, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent out there 12,000 of their most valiant men and they commanded them saying, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, including the women and children. Has this gone from bad to worse? It's gone from bad to worse. And this is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every man and every woman who has known a man intimately. Verse 12, so they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not been with a man or known a man intimately. And they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. 
Then the whole congregation sent word to the children of Benjamin who were at the rock of Rimmon and announced peace unto them. So Benjamin came back at that time and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh Gilead and yet they had not found enough for them. How many men of Benjamin were left? 600. But how many young virgins did they take from Jabesh Gilead? 400. And so there were not enough. Verse 15. And the people grieved for Benjamin. And notice how this is worded. Because the Lord had made a void in the tribes of Israel. Is this the Lord's fault? It's not the Lord's fault. <laughs> You're the ones that went in killing women and children. You were the ones that went in and, and wound up taking this against the whole tribe. Now, granted, the whole tribe did defend them, and so you had to do that to a point. But, but once the, the victory had been won, it should have been over. You know, this is not the Lord's fault. This is your fault. And then you were also the ones that didn't have any better sense than to make an oath before it ever got started saying, well, none of us are going to give our daughters to marry into the tribe of Benjamin. You shouldn't have made that oath. It's all overreaction. Listen to me. When, when you're in a state of moral confusion and you've lost sight of what's right and wrong because you've gotten away from God, you know what you'll do? You'll make some dumb decisions. True or false? You'll make some dumb decisions. And, and yet, this is worded here as if they want to make it God's fault. Verse 15. But that's as old as man, isn't it? Who, who, who did Adam want to blame in the Garden of Eden? Well, he wanted to blame his wife, but he also wanted to blame God. He said, the woman whom you gave me, God. And so this is an old problem right here. Uh, apparently there were two oaths. I about skip this. There were apparently two oaths made at Mizpah at the tribunal. Number one, we're not going to give our daughters to the Benjamites any longer. But number two... Anybody that didn't show up for this assembly, we're going to go and kill them. Well, they made that oath, and when they found out that Jabesh Gilead had not shown up, they said, hey, we can make this work for us. We can go kill all the men and the married women, and, and, and then we can take their virgin girls and, and find wives for the Benjamites, and everything will work out. Well, everything worked out except they were 200 short. Um. But they acted as, by the way, if you've got 400 married couples, do you think you can pretty well spare a tribe? I think you can pretty well spare a tribe with 400 married couples. Yeah. So why do you have to act like those 200 that didn't get a wife, that that's not going to work out, you know? Yep, yeah, but what I'm saying is, is even if those 200 don't ever get their own wives, the tribe itself won't be exterminated. Not with 400 families. But again, we're not, we're not dealing with clear thought. We're dealing with confusion, Rich. Good point. That's a good point. Why act like that you're not going to do what you're doing? <laughs> you know? That's a good point. Now, one thing about it is we know that Phinehas is still alive. Phinehas was a man. He was, he was old enough in the book of Numbers that he could thrust that spear through the Israelite man and the Midianite woman who were being immoral. And so this has got to be early on. You know, for Phinehas to still be alive when he was an adult in Numbers, he's lived all the way through Joshua. Now we're in the book of Judges and so maybe this is early enough on, Rich, that, that maybe their intermarrying with the heathen is not as widespread yet, maybe. But, but you still bring up a good point to think about. All right. So uh, they, they plan the abductions. And then you can read about this in verses 16. What are we going to do for the, the wives of those who remain, the 200 of Benjamin, that, that don't have wives? And uh, they, they act like they've got to go ahead and get these other 200 as well. Well, we can't get them from our own daughters, verse 18, because of the oath. We swore that we wouldn't give our wives. 
And so there was a feast every year in Shiloh, verse 19. In fact, there is a yearly feast of the Lord, which is in north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem and south of Lebanon, Lebona. Therefore they instructed the children of Israel or children of Benjamin saying, Go lie wait in the vineyard and watch. And just when the daughters of Shiloh come out to perform their dances, then come out from the vineyards and carry man a wife for himself from the daughters of Shiloh and go, take them and go back to the land of Benjamin. Then it shall be when their fathers or their brothers come to us to complain that we will say to them, be kind to them for our sakes because we did not take a wife for any of them in the war. For it is not as though you have given the women at this time, making yourselves guilty of your oath. You didn't give them. They were just kidnapped. They were just taken. Well, this is a far-fetched plan. When you... Uh, when you get away from doing things God's way, will you try to find every loophole you can find? This is a loophole. This is a loophole. If we let the, if we let the men kidnap our daughters, then we can say that we didn't give them as wives. They were just kidnapped. They were taken against our will. Well, it wasn't against your will. You let it happen. But anyway, it just shows you the confusion, the craziness. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that with all the depravity, and this kind of ties in with what Rich said too, with all of the, the other things they were doing that was wrong, buddy, they are dead set on honoring these oaths, aren't they? <laughs> they are dead set on it. I mean, they, they can practice idolatry. They can disobey by not exterminating the people of the land. They can just disregard everything else God says. But we made an oath. We better keep that. You know, Jesus talked about those who would strain at a gnat and then swallow a what? Swallow a camel. Strain in a gnat. They'd strain to do some little old thing over here, but then they'd let something big like idolatry and murder, they'd let that go over there. Isn't that amazing? That's the way people are. So there was this annual feast. The virgins were, 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 were dancing. By the way, as far as I can tell in the Bible, do you know every time we read about dancing, do you know that it's segregated? Every time. The women dance with the women. You didn't have men and women carousing and doing all that stuff. The times that, that I know of that I can find in the scripture when you do read about dancing, the sexes were segregated. They were separated. That's interesting. You think there's a lesson in that for us? I think there very well is. All right. And so the, the Benjamites were instructed to kidnap their wives from among those virgins that were performing that annual dance. Read about that. They were probably, this was probably an annual feast that was commemorating and maybe even imitating Miriam. She uh, led a dance after the crossing of the Red Sea. And notice it was segregated. Who, who went out with her? All the women. No, no record here that the men were uh, dancing and, and cavorting with the women like that. No indication at all. And so the planned abductions took place. Now the 600 Benjamite men, all of them have their own wives. They go back to, to Benjamin. They rebuild their cities. They get on with their lives. Life goes back to normal. Look at 24 and 25. So the children of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and his family. They went out from there, every man to his own inheritance. Life gets back to normal. But in those days, there was no king in Israel. So what have we been reading about? Everybody did what? You had a mess. You had a mess. Okay. And so that's the book of Judges. Any questions or any comments as we close tonight. So if we're going to get away from God's pattern and following God's word, can we expect things to get better or get worse? They're going to get worse. We can even wind up looking pretty dumb, can't we? Pretty foolish. All right. Let's bow for a brief word of prayer and, uh, and we'll be dismissed. Oh, by the way, before I do that,
Next Monday is test day, a week from tonight. Anybody else want to take the test this time? Maybe. If you do, oh, it's spring break, so you won't be here. Okay. I know Mitch is taking it. I hope Mitch is well. Have you heard? Okay. We'll check on Mitch, but we won't meet next Monday because next Monday, a week from now, is test, testing night. Our next class will be two weeks from tonight, Lord willing, two weeks from tonight, and we'll start the book of Ruth. We've only got two sessions. We'll cover all of Ruth, Lord willing, and the course will be over. All right, let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, we love Thee and we thank Thee for loving us. We thank You, Father, for Your Word. Father, we thank You that we've had this time together tonight to open Your Word and to study the richness thereof. Father, we ask that the things we have said and taught, we pray that they have been acceptable in, in Your sight, pleasing and true to Your Word. Father, to help us as students to take these things as we find them to be true in Your Word and and to apply them to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.